This is part two of my conversation with my guest and expert witness, Hilary Cotton. Hilary is a social entrepreneur and author of Radical Help, a brilliant book. We talk together about principle two, where there's ruin, there's hope. I loved our conversation because in Hillary and in her book, Radical Help, I found someone who stimulated my thinking around what it means to build authentic community, empowering individuals rather than robbing them of the opportunity to be involved. So, Hillary, you've listened to me. You may agree, you may disagree. You've spent your life researching this stuff. And this is the great thing that I really respect about you, doing things, working with people, working in local communities. So what do you make of what I say? Well, Steve, I wanted to kind of jump in so many times when you were talking. Um, and it's kind of hard to know where to start. Now my, I'm sort of brimming <laughs> with kind of things that, that I want to talk about. I mean, you started with sort of COVID and how we kind of had different boats. And in fact, I, I heard you say that. And, and you talk about the economic crisis. And I actually think that we need to put the environmental crisis kind of firmly mm. in the picture as well, because that's going to be, it's not going to huge. affect us equally. And it's, it's so huge. And, and I think, you know, what's so interesting about all these things is that that they don't necessarily affect us in the way that we think will be affected. That what we can see is that kind of horizontal bonds and solidarity is like what really makes a difference. For me, one of the kind of most interesting things about COVID was that, you know, the, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson set up this helpline and everybody who wanted to help could sign up. You know, you could sign up to take somebody to hospital or whatever. And, you know, we know that thousands and thousands of British people signed up and absolutely nobody asked for help from the helpline. And then, of course, in streets, people had WhatsApp groups and they helped each other. And I think this is like such a brilliant example of what you're talking about, which is that we want to be involved. We want to help each other. We don't want to be done to in any way whatsoever. So if it feels like we don't know who's offering the help and who's kind of taking the help and it feels kind of, you know, like a genuine human relationship and really solidaristic, we can we can start to kind of grapple with that and really change our systems. And we really learned that, didn't we, in COVID? We could see it so clearly. And I think one thing to discuss is, you know, why we're not kind of putting those lessons into practice. And perhaps part of that is something else you touched on in the kind of when you started, you know, framing the economic crisis, which is that one thing that I'm concerned about is that we seem increasingly unable to imagine realities of people who don't live like us. I think we do sort of people making decisions very often, kind of at the height of systems, at the sort of top of these very vertical industrial systems, which, as you say, aren't working, seem not to be able to kind of imagine what needs to happen and not to be able to listen, really, because, as you say, the kind of answers are kind of with people themselves. So I love the fact that you say that. And I also love the fact that you have brought in kind of all the workers and the professionals in our system, because absolutely, these are just incredible people who are stuck in these systems, filling out forms, kind of being robbed of their time and being robbed of their human instincts, really, of how to help people. Because, you know, you sort of have to keep managing risk rather than creating possibility. And then that makes it really difficult to, to kind of get alongside people, which is really what you're talking about about isn't it it's like how can we get alongside people i often think actually hillary when we talk about health and safety it's nothing to do with health or safety it's to do with indemnity yes. a, lot of, a lot of we talk about because health is about risk isn't it so i find you know i began as a youth worker i still think of myself as a youth worker though i know i look, don't look like one very much but youth work is is about health, but it's about fun and it's about well, activity. Well, life is about risk, about, isn't yeah, it? I mean, you know, like, yeah. like, you know, I mean, my work, I'm very influenced by Aristotle and his idea of kind of what makes a good life. And what makes a good life is taking risk. It is also not always being happy, isn't it? It's, it's about kind of grappling things, of course, with support around you. And mm. that's what you're talking about is how do we get those 21st century systems of support so that we can experiment and take risk and mm. we don't just fall into nothing. Or, you know, another thing you talked about, you know, which is very familiar to me, is kind of, you know, one thing I see with the families I work with, for example, is how welfare systems can just trap people exactly where they are. So you've got so many people kind of intervening and kind of, you know, literally targeting a family in the middle, mm. as you say, not not speaking to each other mm. in any way. And then people are kind of trapped in these systems. Yeah. Now, I do think we need investment. We, re I mean, I'm mm. kind of nervous when you say it doesn't matter. I mean, 
I think something that has really changed since the publication of Radical Help, for example, is how much our systems have been starved of, yes. of resource in oh, yeah, every no. way, yeah. human, financial. Yeah. But then the question is, where do we put that resource and that's yeah, what you're yeah. speaking to which i very yeah. much agree with which yeah, isn't yeah. these 1950s vertical systems no, it's no. the kind of horizontal no, bonds no. between us i'm not saying that investment's not needed i'm saying that you can spend as much money as you like on the wrong absolutely intervention the wrong system and you're just wasting it and sadly in my job i see the wastage huge wastage of public money huge wastage because if the thing is broken, if it doesn't work, it's not going to start working just because you sling cash at it. But, but we do need investment. And what do you think would be the thing, Steve, that would get everybody to sort of begin to be able to re-gear systems together? Because obviously, you know, in my work, I really talk about the capability approach. You know, I mean, you've talked about the hot dog, which I really love. And, you know, Martya Sen, the Indian economist who kind of, uh, you know, is sort of with Martha Nussbaum at the, at the kind of heart of this approach – became interested because what he realised in his native India was that people, when they starved, they were usually very close to food. And I think this is a kind of metaphor for modern Britain, isn't it? It's like all of us are close to abundance mm. and yet we're not able to kind of connect to that abundance, whether it's kind of good schools or a good good job or, you know, whatever it is mm. or, or, you know, good help, really. Mm. And so that's why kind of I've thought, you know, what what are the kind of set of principles that everybody could ha could sort of believe in and kind of work towards? And I wonder what you would put at the heart of the system to sort of enable it to kind of, it's like a kaleidoscope to shift so that we can kind of make that change. I think that for myself, when I'm not engaged in something, it's very easy to pour scorn on it, to be cynical about it. I've witnessed that in my own character. But once I have skin in the game, once I'm invited in, once I feel that this is something to do with me, I become very positive. Well, that's so interesting, that isn't it? Because, you know, we're talking about system change. And as you know, kind of my work is about sort of large scale experiments. And I find that they move through the system for exactly that reason, because you're not going to a minister's desk and saying, oh, you know, could we have this now, please? You, you've actually made it yourselves. And there's been a yeah. huge community in the making of it. So and then, you own yes, it. absolutely. Yes. And that's, I think that's how you inspire a community. I grew up in Croydon. And um, I remember one day standing in the middle of the Croydon and it must have been the uh, local elections because in the bus stop, you know, in a bus stop, they often put an ad in there. And this advert, it just said, Q for question. What takes just two minutes but lasts four years? And then at the bottom of the advert, it's a big one. It said A for answer, your vote. <laughs> and I just like... I was like, I could not believe, like, what a dismissal of democracy. You know, just spend two minutes, two minutes, put your tick in the box for someone else and then hold them to account whilst you sit on your couch and do nothing. Um, so I remember my dad saying to me, the society he grew up in, he grew up in India, you know, and he grew up in a place where he said, our community was what we made it. We all work for it. We didn't delegate our responsibility to somebody else by voting for them. We knew that we were poor. We knew that our community was about us putting our effort in for everyone. And I remember him telling me, and we loved it. We loved it because we took ownership of it. I think across the years, across the decades that Oasis has existed, that's the principle I've learned time and time again. Give people a job to do, give them a vision, and they all start buying into it. In Waterloo, we um, set up, this should be you talking, not me, but in Waterloo, St. Thomas's Hospital had some scrap land uh, that was just overgrown and it was endless needles from, you know, from drug use on it. And it was totally overgrown. And I said to the hospital one day, who were wonderful, I said, they were getting loads of complaints about it. I said, why don't you lease the land to us on a peppercorn and we'll turn it into a community farm? I said, not only will you not get any more complaints, but some of the people who spend most time in the local GPs or in A&E with all their, their, their complaints and et cetera, et cetera, they'll be fit and healthy because they get involved in running this farm and they love it. And, you know, we've run that farm for a decade now and that's exactly what's happened. The local community love it. They get involved. We've got some goats and some sheep and but we grow things. And the number of volunteers who say to me, you know, Steve, before this, 
I used to be down with doctors all the time on antidepressants and sit at home. But now I've lost three stone, I've made friends, and I believe in our community. It's a little example here, really, but I think that's what we do, need to do nationally. Well, we need a story we can live into, don't mm. we? And I think the kind of incredible thing about the welfare state in the beginning was that it was a story that we all believed in. Like everybody yes. could see themselves reflected. Everybody had a slightly different version of it, of course, mm. but we kind of thought that we would be taken care of, that we would play our role in it. It was never imagined. It would just be a kind of system doing stuff to us. And I think that the kind of work that I've been involved in that I'm you know, most proud of having played a part in is where you know, I've been part of something that creates that story. I mean, I think you know that in Radical Help, I tell the story of the family work I did, which starts, you know, with with, with six mothers um, who live on an estate in, in Swindon, who've had sort of multiple, you know, you're very familiar with this, multiple interventions in their lives, nothing changes, you know, another person comes and... Um, we were invited in by the, the leader of, of Swindon and the chief executive who said, you know, can you help? And I said, frankly, I've got no idea, but maybe I can kind of, you know, meet the, meet the mums and we can have a chat. And, and the first thing we did was we asked, you know, the professionals to step back and kind of begin to think about what the families dreamt of for their lives. Of course, then the professionals came back in. They played a really critical role. But this kind of went sort of family by family and then from one estate to another estate and then from Swindon to other places. And one of those places was Wigan, where we did very similar work. And through that work, um, the the incredible leader and chief executive of Wigan, Donna Hall and, and Peter Smith, who sadly kind of recently died, had this story which they called The Deal. And they said, we're going to have a deal. You know, we're going to kind of, you know, talk to our citizens and say, what would you like? And we're going to give back assets. I mean, this wasn't kind of like, oh, we can't afford the swimming pool. It was that their vision was that these assets belong to the community anyway, a bit like the farm mm. example you're talking about. So let's give them to the community. They'll have then kind of assets and capital and they'll run them in a completely different way. And what then happened over the next decade in Wigan is completely extraordinary. But what, one of the things I just love about it is, is that everybody knew the story of the deal. So if you stopped at a a bus stop in Wigan and you said to somebody, you know, like, um, what, what's the story of the deal? They would say, you know, well, our Donna, Donna Hall, the kind of chief executive of Wigan, you know, she, she thinks we should help each other. And then they'd probably tell you a story about how they now kind of stop and carry somebody else's shopping home. So yeah. what was brilliant about this, and I think that this kind of speaks to sort of, you know, your sort of post-system change, if you like, is that it was about services. It, it was about kind of improving health, improving family services. It was about assets. Let's give people the land. Let's give people the swimming pools. But it was also about that kind of micro interaction that kind of basically gave people permission to be good neighbours. And it was completely transformative, yeah. you know, at every every single level. And I think that's that's the sort of knitting that we've got to kind of encourage people to do. It builds community. It builds health. It, it really revolutionises everything. Um, when the um, 2012 riots, you remember that? Yes, it's I 2012? do. 2012, yes, yes, yeah, yes. I think it was. Too. They happened in August. I was away. I'd just gone on holiday to Cyprus with my wife and we landed and I was told I was going to turn off my phone. And we landed at the airport and my phone rang as soon as I switched it on. And it was the chief executive of a, a London borough who said, uh, Steve, uh, I'm sorry to ring you, but some bad news. And uh, I, I said, well, uh, well, what's that? He said, well, you know the new school, school building that you've built? We had just built a new school building. He said, well, uh, last night in the riots down the road, a giant warehouse was destroyed. And the police tell us, because they can get it off the kids' phones, that tonight your school building, is, it costs £30 million, is going to be burnt. So I said, well, if the police know, can the police yeah, stop not it? do something about <laughs> you know? it. And he said, no, they, he said they're, they're overwhelmed. I said, well, what about the fire brigade? No, he said they can only attend once it's on fire. So I said, so why are you phoning me then? He said, I'm phoning you to make sure there's no one on site. Um, you lock it down so the fire doesn't spread, if, if you can help that. But you mustn't have anyone on site. You, all security stuff must be off site. And uh, I, I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> and I thought, well, we can't take the security stuff off site because then the insurance on the building will be invalid. So what I did was I phoned one of our youth workers because we'd run a youth club in the area for five, six years. And um, she was in her 20s. And uh, I said, uh, her name's Kat. And I told Kat this story. And this was about four o'clock by then. And I said, so they're going to burn down the school. And so she said, well, why are you telling me? I said, well, you've got to stop it. 
And she said, how will I do that? I said, I have no clue. <laughs> yeah. and, but it's up to you. Think about it. That night, Hillary, the building didn't burn down. Do you know what Kat did? She got loads of the kids from the youth club and they baked cakes because she often baked cakes with them. And they went and they sat outside the school building all night and gave out cakes. And people and came talk, and, it and talked to the kids that came along. And it was because no one destroys something who uh, that belongs to someone yeah. they know. Yeah. You know, and it's the lack of community, the lack of relationship that makes it possible to beat someone up or to steal their phone or to, you know, to raid their shop. What I found through those riots, because we work in quite a lot of London boroughs, shopkeepers that knew the, the young people, the teenagers in the community, none of their shops were broken into. Mm. Relationship. Yeah. It's Again, you know, one of the things about our current systems is that they were designed to keep relationships out. And now we need different systems that can kind of foster those relationships. But, you know, I've found, I mean, I've written about this in Radical Help, the stories of, of the youth work in Radical Help, that you know, traditional youth services can find this quite difficult because, again, back to risk, we've been trained to kind of try and contain those relationships and see them as dangerous. But a bit like your cake story, if everybody's there, there's nothing dangerous, is there? There's kind of, you know, everybody can see what's happening. It's sort of out in the open. People are connecting with one another. And this is kind of, this is the kind of mindset. But I think it is, it's about shifting the mindset with which yeah. we design. Yeah. And then, then I think as well, not just at this individual micro level of inviting uh, uh, individuals in, but wonderful community groups, tiny charities. I'm not talking about Oasis, it's about, uh, not, not about us, but small charities who do this fantastic job. So what happens is you get a switch to what's called a, a system that's more efficient, where you can only access something digitally, but lots of people can't access anything digitally. And so you find that the government system, the statutory system, is more efficient because it's now totally Well, online. that's why I asked you about what values you'll put at the heart yeah. of your kind of new system, because what is is it that, you know, I mean, at the moment that my current work is all about the future of work. I mean, one of the things mm. that I'm sort of obsessed with is the fact that, you know, it's not currently possible for most people in Britain to kind of earn a living and keep their family mm. on what they earn because jobs mm. are so poorly paid and, and mm. you know, there's such problems with kind of time and so on. And so, you know, in that sense, you can have as, as brilliant school system if you like, as you like, but if a family can't keep themselves together, I mean, our, our our welfare systems, of course, were designed around the idea that everybody had good work and then you might need some help mm. afterwards rather than kind of, you know, the, the systems kind of, you know, become completely out of kilter. But, and and so, you know, I'm doing this work in communities and, and I, everywhere I work, there are incredibly strong community organisations. And I, you know, I mean those micro, real community, mm. I don't mean kind of the big voluntary sector, mm. I mean real community organisations. But the way that our systems are currently set up makes it, it makes it very, very hard for kind of resources to flow to that kind of yeah, network. Absolutely. Again, it's quite it's a challenge of relationships yeah, about yeah. how they might be, you know, not just ask for their opinion or to give away their knowledge, but actually the people kind of with the power at the heart who know everybody anyway. Absolutely. So I know of a little charity to my to, to that exactly that point. Uh, the statutory services digitalized, brought everything online, which means lots of people can't access it because they don't have their digital skills, not just the elderly, but lots of uh, younger families as well. So this little charity... Well, we saw this in COVID, of course, yeah, as well. this little charity on a shoestring supplies all of the support to the local residents to access the service, which the statutory authorities say is now streamlined. It's not streamlined. It's not efficient. Somebody else is helping them out. But that little charity struggles to survive and it, it, you know, it goes for funding pot after Absolute, funding yeah, pot yeah. and then there are gaps and they have to cut back and they lose skills and they almost go bankrupt. Then they start again. And it strikes me that it's not just the individual we're le leaving out through, uh, through lack of relationship, but we're leaving out these wonderful community organisations that were always there and if invited in would offer a wonderful layer of protection and caring communities. But, but you know what, I think it's so interesting because one of the reasons we don't see, you know, again, this goes to the kind of the, the system challenge, which because one of the reasons that we don't see uh, see sort of these horizontal bonds is because we have become very individually focused. You know, the kind of 1950s system is, you know, I've got a resource and I'm going to, you know, find that person, target them and pass that resource to that individual, whether it's a kind of family service or a youth service or whatever it is. And of course, what we need to do is, is kind of think, think in 
thinking groups, thinking collaborative groups. I mean, in the work that I do in the in the original design work, I never work with individuals. I work with groups. So if I meet you, let's say, I'll say, okay, Steve, who are your mates? Who's your family? Can you bring them with you? So right from the very beginning, when we're kind of doing the explorative work, we're doing it within a social network. People say completely different things. They dare to share emotions. They have different dreams. It's such a different way of starting than if you start with an individual. But we've become, you know, this individualization is part of the problem of the system. Mm. So last question, Hillary. Yes. In the light of everything you've said, we've said together, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the next 10 years? Ah, you know, the famous kind of optimism of the will and pessimism of the intellect. The next 10 years. So I think we've got kind of three huge challenges. I think we've got a challenge of the economy, lopsided economies, which really need to be structurally altered. It's not just a cost of living crisis. I think we've got an environmental crisis that we barely dare talk about. And I think we've got kind of legacies of injustice, of kind of race in particular, but also gender that we kind of still aren't really kind of talking honestly enough about. Um, I think if we can have those honest conversations, I feel really optimistic because what I do see in my kind of everyday work is ideas, actual work, exactly as the way you're talking about kind of people in communities. But we we do need a very different conversation and a very different starting point. Um, you know, one of your principles, I think, is, is to kind of, you know, not think in kind of short term cycles, but to think over the next 20 years. If we can kind of expand the horizon and think like that, then yes, I'm very optimistic. So my friend, who uh, has a very central role in the life of you know, one city, yes. you know, his big thing is, we, as I said, we don't do development. We give out money, but we just keep people happy in their poverty rather than seeing any real progress for them or their children or their children's children. So people get stuck yeah, I think this is so important because also you talk, you talk, Steve, about kind of, you know, moving from outputs to outcomes. But what you're saying now is is much bigger than that, I think, and and much more important. And, you know, the first half of my life I worked in, you know, I'm quite old, what was then called the developing world, but, you know, obviously is kind of most of the world. Um, and, and you know, with a, with a very, very different perspective about, you know, not just moving somebody from A to B, but really thinking how do we grow? And so I kind of, you know, would liken it to a flower that the, you know, what is the peak rose? You know, is it is it the moment of the bloom or is it it's dying? and it's losing its petals and then the seed that goes around again. And I think that this is the sort of more kind of the mindset. I mean, you talk also about ruins and I don't know, I feel kind of, I don't, I don't really like the sort of ruin analogy, but, you know, I think about composting, you know, what's in our system now that we can kind of compost and reuse again. And I think if we could shift from that sort of very transactional outcome output to this idea of development and the kind of developmental stories that in us, in our systems, we could really begin to kind of see the possibilities of change. Yeah, when I use the term outcome, of course, I mean that. You, I, I know you do, but I think, but I think it goes back into this. I mean, yeah. one of the things we could talk about is, you know, how how one can shift a narrative and then things get sort of taken back and the words change, but the same mm. things happen. Mm. And I suppose that what I'm kind of reaching for is something that gets out of all of that. And I think you are too, and kind of goes into sort of, you know, a very, very different way of looking at things, you know, in your in work that can kind of stand alongside many generations, you know, like the hot dog story. You know, it's not just about that child there, is it? It's about the child's family, the brother that he's taking the hot dog to and just thinking in that sort of arc I think is really important mm. yeah and the day when those brothers run a hot dog superstore <laughs> <laughs> and, and create food for lots of other people as well as wealth for their family and contribute back into society etc cetera, etc cetera. some years ago well it's quite a lot of years ago 1994 I think it was um, there was um, a giant earthquake in a part of India of said that I'm half Indian and um, I managed to get together a fund and it was very hard work but where there this devastation was 44 villages had been destroyed and um, and the, the Red Cross and big aid agencies were rebuilding houses um, which they didn't do very well to tell you the truth but um, there was an opportunity to build a hospital um, and uh, I managed to raise enough money with the help of some friends and we built this hospital and um, now that was 94 so now you know 30 years on that hospital has become a whole town 
Right. It's an amazing thing. We built it in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and then the, a little crossroads grew up and then some little shops arrived and then uh, a school was added. And now the the hospital, which is called GM Priya, has become the name of a town. And <laughs> businesses have started, et cetera, et cetera. So out, that's what you're talking about, isn't it? Out of that Poverty has grown this self-sustaining community that's looking out for itself. It's got its own town council, etc. Yes, et cetera. and I think what I'm you saying know. is that we can see each other like that. You yeah. know, the kind of in in the human way. I mean, obviously, yes, buildings, but also just kind of it, we, yes. we need to see humans in that way as well. Yes. Really, and well, it's all about back to relationships, yes. isn't it? Yeah, it's the relationships that keep moving this forward. And all, the way I see it, whilst relationships are healthy. Whilst there's a vision and good relationships, you move forward. Hilary, when I say that I don't really believe the system's broken because I don't believe there ever was one, there's lots of ill-fitting parts that don't quite work together. What's your take on that? Yeah, I'm not quite sure. I think that there is a system, actually. I completely agree with you that the system doesn't talk to each other. I mean, my work is always kind of in those bits. And even if you get everybody into the same room, it's not that easy because they're all walking, you know, working to different regulations and so on. But I think that there is a welfare system um, which encompasses, you know, health, education, all these parts. And, of course, Beveridge, who was sort of, you know, the father of the system, if you like, was sort of panicked, really. I mean, that's kind of, you know, I take his third report where he said that and start my own manifesto because he never wanted that system. What he wanted was, mm. you know, something that was much more flexible with much more room for community, which he thought had the ideas and the imagination. Volunteerism. Volunteers, you know. And of course, what happened was that he made that point and the voluntary sector were so busy fighting each other, sound familiar, that they, you know weren't able to actually um, kind of come together and kind of capitalise on it. So I think that we we do have a system. And I think that one of the kind of something that's very interesting in kind of what you've written and what you've talked about today is that we definitely need a, a system in the sense that things talk to each other. But I don't think what we want is a kind of universal system. I mean, I would say one size fits nobody. And actually what we want is kind of lots and lots of you know, very small parts that have kind of resource, have ownership that can work, mm. that are operating towards a, within a kind of bigger value system, if you like. In Radical Help, I talk about, you know, how we need the state as a gardener to kind of set out the plot of the garden. Sometimes might have to do a bit of weeding. But once that's set out, then we're all allowed to kind of garden in our individual way within the garden. So I think that, that that's what we need. And at the moment we have, we do actually have a system that makes it very difficult to do that because, you know, as you've alluded to many times in the conversation we've had this afternoon, very often systems says no doesn't it and it's it's not down there's not a person there saying no if, if only it was that simple it's that it's that the system itself is blocking things yeah, so yeah. i think we have yeah. one and we have to kind of compost it basically <laughs> yeah or you know we one cog turns and we expect all the others to turn yes but, you know my analogy they're just not connected to one another i remember sitting with a secretary for health um and um they said to me, should give the gender away, they said to me, Steve, could you talk to the, um, the, the Secretary for Education? Uh, because I, I, I'd like to really understand how the schooling academy system works. And then I wonder, Steve, if you would produce a briefing paper for me so that I could understand academies and how health might work with them. And I said... But you're both in the same cabinet and you sit in the same room and you talk about the same social issues. And they said, yeah, but you just don't understand, Steve. That's not how it works. And it never will be, will it, until basically we, we turn it on its head and we start with people in their lives where all these things connect in a really simple way, don't they? It doesn't connect in the silos of government and it's very hard once you are kind of the minister at that level. But actually in our lives, in our communities, in our relationships with one another, those things connect. And it's much easier if you start there and then kind of go mm. outwards. But you see, I see it the other way up at the same time. One of the big problems, the challenges we have in Oasis, we run schools, we run community centres, we run local libraries, we run farms, as I've said. We run, uh, we, we're just taking on a chunk of the justice system. Uh, we have we work in hospitals, A and E's uh, around the country, and all of these systems have their own pay and conditions, 
and they have their own pension arrangements and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So joining them up and getting integration is really difficult because the systems themselves get in the way of real integration. Yeah. Uh, it's a real problem to us. And I think that that's the same. You know, I see that in my my work with social work, let's say, or with care work, which is that, you know, you you can you can be a leader and you can say, you know, we, we want to kind of support people and work, you know, listen to people. But if all your staff really are incentivized to kind of meet various outputs that are, or even outcomes that are kind of results of that particular system, you're not going to be able to work together. And so that's why I think it is kind of, you know, I would say not bottom up or top down, but starting with people with those communities and then kind of working mm. horizontally mm. out. I mean, I think we need to be horizontalists, really, kind of out like this, holding hands with one another, if you like. Hillary, fantastic. I mean, it honestly is a wonderful, brilliant thing for me to sit and talk with you. And I could talk with you and learn from you for days and days and days but thank you for your time here which i know everyone who listens will find extraordinarily valuable well it's brilliant to meet you and i'm really looking forward to reading the book thank you so much for having me